Thank you very much. Uh, essentially what I want to talk about this evening is uh, the question of how Ishmaelite religion, the religion of the Bani Ismail, in its uh, assumed normativity is going to develop a sense of its relationship to an ambient British culture which no longer self-defines as monotheistic. Those who continue to find comfort in Quranic truth but are invited to be Western citizens as well face one of the most notorious of contemporary antinomies. In the case of those Muslim and non-Muslim populists who claim that the two cannot meet seems to be strengthened by Britain's general turning away from faith. Muslims are imagined to represent the most stubborn and frequently denounced exemplars of a tendency amongst conservative religious communities to be in key respects disengaged from wider society and to express doubts about the national socio-ethical consensus. As it turns out, this claim rests on rather slight, slight foundations. All the research suggests that Muslims themselves consistently show themselves committed to a convivial and integrated existence in modern Britain. In 2009, the Gallup organisation carried out the largest ever opinion survey among British Muslims with a view to determining their positions on various indices of identity and citizenship. In general, the results were not surprising to the community's leaders, although they <coughs> challenged some images widely cherished in the popular press. For instance, it emerged that 77% of Muslims identified very strongly with the UK, compared to 51% of the general population. 76% of Muslims expressed confidence in the police, compared to 65% of the wider public. Only 3% of Muslims felt that other religions were threatening their way of life, compared to a national British figure of 25%. Muslims were significantly more likely than other communities, 67% against 58%, to live in ethnically mixed areas, and were less willing to live in areas largely made up of members of their own group, 17% against 33%. <coughs> Religiosity did not correlate at all with support for violence against civilians. So it does seem not only that Muslims here want to belong, but that they feel that they do belong. And yet the exact temper and theological framing of this Muslim wish to integrate in Britain, despite the country's advanced and advancing secularity, turns out to be a complex and obscure matter when we cast around in search of the exact identities of the two partners in this dance. The question of a British Islam raised with increasing frequency by anxious politicians and social administrators is never going to find a straightforward answer, as there are multiple British and also Islamic identities and normativities. But what Whitehall demands and the ever-growing bullhorn pro proclamations of the nativist right insist is not really an Islamic evolution of what is indigenously British, for the post-theistic British themselves have largely forsaken that. The distinctive and very moral world of British churchmanship, together with an affection for Vaughan Williams, briar pipes and warm <coughs> beer, is recalled only by the very old who are allowed little say in our public discourse. In place of a British tradition with which Muslims should engage, we now have British values. And these, according to gov.uk, turn out to have nothing to do with our local particularity, but comprise a raft of global liberal beliefs of the latest and most absolute kind. <clears throat> this is a very radical evolution for a hitherto self-consciously distinctive island nation. Until very recently, the past was allowed a significant vote in our national present. The House of Lords formed a sort of constitutional guarantor of this, together with the bench of bishops and the retired blimps and the noblesse oblige of the remaining politically active aristocracy. But this system, with its Christian foundations, was already in full decline when Thatcher and Blair briskly swept away its mouldering remains and replaced it with a cool Britannia in which the atomized, pastless individual and his or her rights and success in wealth creation lay at the heart of the determination of values. Deregulating the stock exchange abolished the old-school chumminess of the stockbroking and banking networks. The broadsheet newspapers, forced to compete with the infinitesimally quick response to news enabled by the internet, tightened their deadlines and coarsened their content. So too did the BBC. Hence the cut glass tones of the home service are replaced 
50 years on by the BBC's easy reading website, packed with clickbait nuggets about one-armed babies and the difficulties of finding trans hairdressers in Uruguay. Modesty and reserve, once the qualities of a people who understood Lord Longford and Mrs Grundy are simply seen as inhibitions in a culture which now mainstreams pornography. And so, in considering the question of integration in Britain, we first need to contend with the fact that the national temperament and British identity have morphed, globalised and been debased into a near absence. The point here is not that we should retreat into a Peter Hitchin sort of dream about a land that was forever England, nor yet to idealise it, a UKIP fool's errand to find comprehensive ideals back in an age of empire and of general race prejudice. Instead, any theologically sensitive account of the current demand that Muslims must integrate needs to be alert to the skittish, quicksilver mobility of the post-religious culture into which the integration must be done, Bauman's liquid modernity. Those of migrant heritage are invited to board a train whose next two stops are more or less guessable, but which, following the collapse of religion and ideology, never tells its passengers what its destination might be. The Ishmaelite, then, is invited and increasingly instructed to board this train to an unknown terminus, because the next stop is always politically correct and discursively unassailable. If he demurs or asks too anxiously about the driver's intentions or the purpose of the whole journey, he may find himself the object of a surprisingly un-British invective. He will be told that he is a chauvinist, a patriarch, that he suffers from a phobia, if he is too confident in what he says, he risks a prevent referral. And certainly he cannot run for parliament or any significant post in local government or work as a marriage registrar. His social beliefs, once quite respectable in Britain, are now almost unspeakable. To voice his conscience may turn him into a pariah. <coughs> what then is the normative Muslim guidance for a community invited to sink its tent pegs in these shifting sands? The Muslim's internal library seems to tell him much about minority existence. For centuries, the Sharia provided a framework for peaceable existence in an almost indefinitely wide range of contexts. Witness, for instance, Sachi Kumurata's research on Muslims in pre-modern China. The Quran shows that even a prophet of God like Joseph may become a civil servant under Pharaoh. His career is held back not by his own confessional scruples, but by allegations of sexual harassment. And under the Ahl al-Kitab, people of the book, matters were even easier, as shown in Dominic Rubin's new book on the history of Islam in Russia. The host might be hostile and impose a thousand sumptuary and other vexations on Ishmael, but the Muslim theological grounds for living as peaceful subjects or citizens were not in doubt. Yet one turns in vain to the pages of the fiqh manuals for guidance on the right and moral engagement with the new type of societies which seem to have no higher purpose and which have deliberately repudiated a prophetic religious heritage with all its immeasurable richness and its thick reasons for leading a common life. Britain is no longer a land of the Ahl al-Kitab. Statistics firmly show that most of our compatriots refuse to self-identify as Christians or Jews. Freelance monotheists, or people with some belief in a higher power, bump up the numbers, but it's not clear that these do not represent just the doomed and confused tail end of a more seriously theistic past. Callum Brown, in his book The Death of Christian Britain, documents this collapse, showing that it came quite suddenly when many migrants arrived in the late 1950s and early 1960s, church-going in the host society was the stable national norm and family life was taken to be regulated by ideals of <coughs> ultimately Christian justification. National service recruits were assumed to be C of E unless they protested to the contrary. Now, the Social Attitudes Survey tells us that only 3% of young people consider themselves to be Anglican. From a fiqh perspective, this transition presents quite acute challenges. Integration with Christians and Jews is simply easier. Intermarriage and dietary regulations are just two indicative examples. We can share bread and a bed with fellow scripturies. But in this new 21st century Britain, Muslims often strain to grasp the moods and motivations of many of their compatriots. What is it actually like to imagine that at the end of life, 
there is only an eternal and hopeless absence. That morality can shift according to the wisdom of the current consensus. That the cosmic imaginary has been inverted so that looking at the miracle of the world brings no breath of transcendence or solace of divine presence. That art is about the turbulences of the self, not about mimesis or truth. As British Muslims, we need to develop an empathetic theology of atheism. It's true that globally, the percentage of atheists is said to be declining. But in the UK, among our neighbours and friends, the familiar assurance that a deep, though complex, mutual trust and recognition, a sense of comity, should naturally exist between fellow Abrahamic believers has become less common. Instead, we break bread with people who believe in a terrifying and meaningless void. And we need an account of this and a programme for convivial and compassionate action. Britain's need for our help is not just economic. Ishmaelites should aspire to be the spiritualising leaven in the rather stodgy national dough. These unchurched fellow subjects are, of course, still humans. They may not know it clearly, but they have immortal souls. In our eyes, their own sense of worth is a drastic underestimation. The Imago Dei, so fundamental a concept for the monotheisms, is veiled, not lost. And insofar as one perceives beauty, sacrifice and sweetheartedness in any human creature, one experiences also the presence of God. Remember the Khalwati belief that the human face includes all the shapes of the Arabic letters, so that the names of God are all written there. Men and women are theomorphic, heirs to the primordial covenant of Alastu Birobbikum, and because they affirmed God on that first of days, their hearts still beat with the divine name, Allah. Hence, while they cannot read the meaning in our faces, we read theirs, and we are reminded of God's majesty and goodness. This is the tradition of the Shahid, humanity as mutely eloquent of the divine. And hence the doctrine, evident particularly in Maturidism, of Ismat al Adamiya. By virtue of Adamic descent, humans are inviolable under the locus of rights. And these are not magically conjured out of dumb matter in the manner of the Kantians, but are a radiance conferred on all humans at the moment of insolment, Nafharuh. Michael Sugic's recent book, Signs on the Horizons, recounts many anecdotes of his experiences with Ishmaelite spiritual masters, whose lives, despite personal and physical suffering, were lived in pure delight. To see any human being is to be reminded of God and the compassionate and incomparable work of his hands. A sage, passing through immigration at Stansted, is not checking his texts, but is composing prayers for the border agency officer and for her parents, children and neighbours. She does not guess it, unless perhaps she is taken aback by the hieratic strength of his face. And so the sage passes his days in wedged in the ecstasy of finding God in every moment. As Saadi says, Bejehan khurram az anum ke jehan khurram az ust. I'm delighted in the world because the world delights in him. What is such an Abrahamic person, a Hanif, sitting on the train to Liverpool Street beside the post-British hipster nodding to the house music on his stereo? Only the Quranic story of the Bazmi Alast seems able to persuade us that they are from the same genus and origin. Once I travelled with a Bosnian imam from the town of Yaitse on his first visit to London. On the underground, he read to me a fragment from a poem from Rumi, which I later looked up and which has stayed with me. Beya beya kenya bi chuma diger yari chuma be jumle jihani khud ko just dildari. Come, come, you will find no other friend but me in the whole of this world. Where will you find a beloved? Beya beya be beher suyi ruzgar mabor kenis naktitura pishi gairi bazari. Come, come, don't spend all your time wandering this way and that, since for your coins. There is no other marketplace. You are like the dry valley, and I am like the rain. You are like the ruined city, and I am like the architect. Apart from serving me, which is the rising places of joy, people have never seen and never will see any sign of joy. A thousand shifting images do you see in your sleep. When sleep is done, you see not one dweller among mankind. 
Close the crooked eye and open the eye of wisdom. The ego is like a donkey and desire is its nosebag. Come to the side of the hospital of your own creator, for whoever does not have that physician has only a medicine that makes him sick. The world is like a body with no head without that king. Around such a head, wrap yourself around like a turban cloth. Come and give thought to me, who gave you your thought? Buy a whole donkey load of rubies from my mind. Come, come forward to the one who gave you your feet. Look with your two eyes, your two eyes, on he who gave you sight. Clap both your hands out of delight in him, your hand is from his sea. There is neither grief nor misfortune when compared to his delight. This is a very well-known ghazal, an ode from Rumi's Divani Shamsi Tabriz. Perhaps the hipster atheist is listening to Madonna's riff on Rumi. But between the enraptured soul of the lover of God as he waits for his stop and his neighbours, there seems to be little common ground. As Charles Taylor sees it, the two are divided not by rival theories, but by different kinds of lived experiences involved in understanding your life in one way or another. And yet, the language of love and the wish to be free of anxiety are obviously universal. They are not theories, but experiences. And the ecstasy of our literature retains a universal appeal. According to the Christian Science Monitor, Rumi is now America's most popular poet. The irony is remarkable. Here was an Afghan Sunni and a famous mosque preacher whose voice still reaches hearts in Trump's America. The now legally binding Muslim ban excludes Afghans from the land of opportunity, but it cannot exclude the voice of this lyrical ecstatic. Here is an asset to be deployed fearlessly by the outwardly deplored Ishmaelites. As Eric Ormsby has shown in a recent book, Islam takes itself to be quintessentially a religion of mahabba, of love for the divine and the human. The founder's eschatological title is Habibullah, God's Beloved, and Muslim literature follows suit with a cornucopia of love poems to God and to his creation, and particularly to the human shahid of both genders. The scripture is a celebration of the indicativity of creation, which is not fallen in Augustine's sense, but simply unremembered and imperfectly noticed. The famous dithyrams about the praise and glorification given by the animals and birds dovetail with the prophet's own intimate engagement with nature and his capacity to hear the praises given to God, even by stones picked up by his hand. Ishmael, ecstatic even on a greater Anglia shuttle, is necessarily made a stranger by this love. And his scriptures tell him that in the end times he will be gharib, exactly, a stranger. Blessed, therefore, are the strangers, the hadith concludes. In a raging world of turbo capitalism, split screen messaging, and galloping automation, the Ishmaelite who turns within is a gypsy, a Roma, a Semitic nomad and wanderer. Ishmael, in the scriptural construction of the role, is precisely the one cast out by privilege, by the elite race and lineage, for he is born of a Gentile mother, African, refugee, asylum seeker. He is the scriptural paradigm of unchosenness and sits in the rain at Calais, waiting for the next truck. Yet, in the great sanct sanctuary at Mecca, which holds the mortal remains <coughs> of Abraham's first son, the world's poor and despised congregate in the love of God. They congregate also in those ghetto mosques which are the most despised spaces in Europe's unreal cities. In Frankfurt basements, they chant the divine name while skinheads hammer on the windows. They are the sign and affirmation that God is, according to the hadith, with the brokenhearted. In the pharaonic world arrogance of biocidal capitalism, the Ishmaelite underclass, despised by left and right alike, stigmatized as fascist or terroristic, continues to love God, in other words, to be normally human. Here then is a hint, perhaps a helpfully Akbarian sign of the direction our theology of atheism should take. The atheist begins with the premise that there is nothing theophanic about human beings. The Ishmaelite begins with the imago Dei, which is inscribed in every man and woman. It is therefore for the believing minorities to reach out, to reopen, as Rumi has it, God's hospital, to find accommodations and forms of living together, 
since the believer has objective reasons to do these things. The citizen who sees humanity only as the blind watchmaker's latest artifact should be treated with compassion as an exile from a world which since before Stonehenge has always been understood as enchanted. Perhaps this re-enchantment, which is the vocation of Europe's Ishmaelite underclass, resembles that of the hero saints of late antique Christianity, who lived under the triumphalist order of pagan Rome. Then too, the civil religion of officialdom required forms of compliance inimical to the Abrahamic conscience. The parallel may be interesting, but mutatis mutandis. Mahabba must be there, but monastic vows of asceticism and celibacy will not be part of the method here, since Ishmael's is a way of celebration and full sociality. He will build no monasteries. This Akbarian method, which makes life for minorities not only bearable but exquisite by insisting on the glorious legibility of life, has nothing to do with the modern ideological reconfigurings of Islam known as Islamism. These may impress anxious, half-westernized community leaders, bourgeois technocrats with shallow roots in our heritage, and because their movement Islam originated with ideologues of the anti-colonial generation, it has an anti-Western instinct and a tendency to ideologize Islam, which makes it assertively insistence on grievance issues and a parallel live solution. These are the Islamisms which, as Wa'il Halaq continues to remind us, are inauthentic Europeanized hybrids, which in the Muslim world fail consistently and must always fail because they seek an impossible state. And the most conspicuously failed of them all, Daesh Salafism, stands evidently at the opposite pole to the inclusive and authentically scriptural policy we have recalled. Unfortunately, the voices of a hyper-reified false scripturalism are growing louder. European governments have been in a clinch with the Saudi fundamentalists for so long that the agenda of divisive tanfir is gaining ground in our communities. A return to an authentic Islamic response to the challenges of our situation must be rooted in a rejection of the fundamentalism which has been aided and abetted by governments hell-bent on armament sales. Da'wah, invitation, not tanfir, repulsion, is the criterion of real prophetic action. And to enable this, we must tirelessly invite the British government to end its Faustian pact with the extremists. But to sum up, the theology we need in order to make sense of our situation and to deal sensibly with the Islamophobia, the niqab <laughs> bans, the school indoctrination, and the job discrimination which we face needs to adopt as its watchword the Quranic verse, wheresoever you turn, there is the face of God. We are not in exile in a strange land. The believer is never abroad. For the man of praise indicates that one of the khasais, the unique traits of his community is the whole earth has been made a mosque for me. So we are exiles from humanity's current inhumanity and from the desiccating winds of atheistic post-normativity. We are not exiles from our good-hearted neighbors or their best traditions and motives. As the hadith says, wisdom is the lost riding beast of the believer. Wherever he finds it, he has the most right to it. What is decently British is also Islamically interesting. And as Al-Ghazali says in one of the most challenging perorations which conclude his revival of the religious sciences, we should not despise any descendant of Adam. The fitra, innate faithful goodness, is not completely lost even in a mass murderer. The spirit, ruh, cannot be extinguished. But to realize this, we need to reduce the superficial outward signs that suggest to our enemies that we are exiles. Many British Muslims are torn not between two poles, but between three, because to Islamic religion and modern Britishness is added the further complex of a specific Muslim culture. But it is largely the older generations which are pulled in these three directions. The young increasingly abandon ethnic and folkloric forms and values in favor of an Islam which is understood as a universal religion, not an aspect of ethnic inheritance. This tendency, in its affirmative modes, should be accelerated since our cultured despisers, who cannot help judging by appearances, frequently object to the spectacular outward tokens of foreignness, the ethnic exotica of the place where granddad was born. Put very crudely, 
A Sharia-compliant headscarf of British inspiration is less likely to invite attack than headgear which proclaims adherence to the culture of a distant land. A man walking the rainy streets of Walsall in desert clothes is inviting the Tanfiri conclusion that Muslims do not belong. The same applies to a Braille v. Milad procession, which would be magnificent in the Lucknow Chowk. Mosque design is another case in point. There is no <coughs> Sharia requirement to make a visual statement that Islam is an alien religion. In fact, the Sharia probably mandates the opposite. Tajweed and Adhan modes can be local and not imported. Aladdin domes, pastiche minarets, pointed windows and other troops, beloved of mosque committees, tend to convey to passers-by the defiant non-Britishness of the community they represent. Passers-by may even be entitled to their indignation. Courtesy and good neighbourliness are the real signs of Islamic authenticity in architecture, not the triumphant vaunting of an ancestral homeland. And if the need for courtesy is not understood, then the need for survival in times of increasing prejudice should be seriously considered instead. But even before this re-religionizing of Islam, we need now to contemplate the sheer fact of <coughs> Muslim persistence. What are we actually doing right? A Cardiff University research study on religious nurture in Muslim families shows that Muslims are generally rather successful in passing their beliefs and practices on to the new generation. The study showed that 77% of adult Muslims actively practice the faith they were brought up in compared with 29% of Christians and 65% of other religions. Again, these numbers directly challenge most sociological theories and allied secular prognostications. The most striking example of what Lord Sachs calls the persistence of faith is offered by Ishmael. <coughs> to offer an account of this ongoing religiosity among the Muslim young and to make of it a sign of hope rather than anxiety to our neighbors, we might start with Charles Taylor's characterization of our time as one of expressive individualism, an extension of the 18th century notion of the pursuit of the self's convictions irrespective of social convention in a search not only for self but for truth and even sometimes transcendence. The ongoing piety of the Muslim young may well be, paradoxically, the fruit of the self's rebellion against parental folkways but also against the totalizing demands of the coercive liberal state and what Taylor calls the felt flatness of modernity. There is something edgy and exciting about an urban Muslim identity which defies the stodgy disapproval of powerful liberal elites. <coughs> but there is something of an inner complementarity here, religion as God's hospital. Taylor points to the failure of the churches to attract young people because although these are certainly the sign of an alternative social imaginary, they reject the Dionysian. He does not note the Islamic exception in Western cities here, but we might observe that the Dionysian is precisely the principle that, for a Nietzsche looking for his Superman, marks out Islam's virile superiority over Christianity. Ian Almond has published extensively on this. Islam is perceived as holistic, as assertive, as affirmative of life, incorporating the body fully into faith. And thus it becomes appealing to those seeking an alternative paradigm, a counterculture, <laughs> to both secular instrumental modernity and to its Christian opposite. Ishmael is, after all, the heir according to the flesh. The appeal of the Sunnah to those seeking a holistic counterculture is evident in an age of anxiety, depression and fissiparous inner lives. Last week, the media noted the research at Mannheim University, which applied the widely known satisfaction with life scale to adherents of different worldviews. This study of almost 70,000 respondents showed that Muslims of all groups are the most satisfied with life, which they interpret in terms of the overall oneness or coherence of their worlds. In second place were those Christians who self-identified as neither Catholics nor Protestants, while the Buddhists came third. The results, published in the Journal of the American Psychological Association, run counter to the usual media image of the angry Ishmaelite and the shrouded unhappy Hajirin but give a good account of our hypothesis that the holism of the sunnah in which body, mind and spirit are experienced as aspects of a unity and bodied forth in the form of the Muslim prayer is making Islam a permanently <coughs> worthwhile option for younger members of fragmented modern cultures. But not all appreciate the charms of Ishmael 
we live in a post-Srebrenica age of organized and paranoid enmity. <clears throat> the son of the flesh has an alarming birth rate and his brethren keep crossing the Mediterranean and the Channel in a kind of economic Dunkirk. 31% of British advocates of Brexit support the Great Replacement Theory, believing that Muslim immigration is part of an elite plot to make Europe an Islamic continent. Although integration is going well and is wanted by Muslims themselves, this is not everyone's perception. In fact, Ishmael has become Europe's dark other, the lightning rod for a thousand fears about identity. A few days ago, Cardinal Robert Sara, prefect of the Vatican's Congregation for Divine Worship, echoed the feelings of many when he spoke out against Muslim migration to Europe. He commented as follows. If the West continues in this fatal way, there is a great risk that, due to a lack of birth, it will disappear, invaded by foreigners, just as Rome was invaded by barbarians. If Europe disappears, and with it the invaluable values of the old continent, Islam will invade the world, and we will totally change culture, anthropology, and moral vision. So here is a further good reason why Muslim insiders need to develop an active pastoral theology which can account for the new populism and offer a moral compass. Europe's gaze is increasingly chauvinistic, expecting of our minority a radical self-dislike and abnegation. However, a majority cannot realistically or sensibly demand a cringing self-flagellation and the endless whimpering of mere culpas from its most significant minority. Ishmaelites and their various sympathizers, not numerous but quietly present everywhere, need to develop their own theory of response to this discursive bullying. Conventional sociological analysis will not help them to frame it. The answer, to be authentically rooted in Muslim experience, must be grounded in the fear of God and the awareness that his decree prevails more reliably than social laws, and that therefore there is always an abundance of hope, and that the Islamophobic other is a victim as well as an offender. The presence of this hope is verified by an inner strength manifested as forgiveness and compassion, virtues difficult for hypocrites, time servers, and private cynics. A widespread Muslim response to secular or sub-Christian discursive violence has been a tit-for-tat reciprocation, tha'r in the Arabic terminology. Not a few ghetto sermonizers of the Andrum Chowdhury type retaliate against the national populists by deploying a bullying agit prop of their own. This in turn quickly displays the familiar drawback of a lex talionis. It tends to ignite a cycle of feuding so that, according to Gandhi's quip, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Frightened inner city preachers confronted by the vitriol of what they experience as a feminist, homosexualist, philo-Zionist, establishment media, and goaded by furious anti-Ishmael politicians of the Wilders or Jensen type, often reply in kind, magnifying the faults of Europe and generalizing about its violent urges, just as effectively as the chauvinists of the host societies are seeking to do in their typecasting of the Muslim soul. A vicious circle is the certain outcome of this, as so often chauvinisms become mutually parasitic. But the odds are stacked against the minorities. In the longer term, if matters progress, it is likely that the weaker and smaller side of this zero-sum game will be destroyed. So we are faced with this challenge, to speak a Muslim language to an insulting and stigmatizing verbal culture, to defend what to us is the most pure and precious set of virtues and forms of life, but which instantiates this anti mortezalite style of the affirmation of judge justice through its transcendence, stepping outside the vicious circle whose secular logic seems so ominous. Where is this to be found? To the perplexity of Islam's culture despisers, such as Tom Wright, who recently told readers of the Times that Jesus' parable of the prodigal son neatly marks out his teaching both from Islam and from the cold logic of secularism, the Qur'an, far from presenting a Mu'tazilite legalism, deeply internalizes its own theology of the transcendence of strict justice. Indeed, the lex talionis is there, and indeed that does, in matters of social boundaries, supply hayat, life, for the made weak, the mustadafin in particular. Life is provided for the oppressed vulnerable, the traveler, the woman, the child, the orphan, the pauper, by their egoless wielding of power, where directed by the qadi. 
The Quranic conception of justice and of the due repulsion of aggression and wrong emerges in opposition to a culture of tribal honor code and a lex talionis which treated the clan as the legal site of juridical personality. These primitively pagan Cosa Nostra idioms of feuding had been endemic in Arabia but were prophetically overturned by the new belief that an enemy's hatred must not lead one into injustice against him, for the ego is never to be obeyed. The Qur'an told its hearers this, O you who believe, be steadfast witnesses for God in equity, and let not the hatred of any people seduce you away from acting justly. Act justly, that is closer to piety. Fear God, truly he is informed of what you do. However, religion's discourse of hosn, of moral beauty, went much further than this. Asherite and Maturidi, classical Sunni exegetes, were not slow to spot its insistence on a meta-justice, which allowed individuals the right to respond not in kind or simply proportionately, but through, in the Qur'an's very graphic, startling phrase, repelling, pushing back with what is more beautiful, idfa' billatihiya ahsan. This phrase stands at the heart of a surah which is particularly insistent on ethics as ihsan, in William Chittick's translation, doing the beautiful. This is surah 41, entitled Fussilat. The most comprehensive accounts here come from Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, who dies in 923, and Fakhreddin al-Razi, who dies in 1209, and the key Quranic sequence reads as follows. Who speaks better than someone who calls people to God, does what is right, and says, I am one of those devoted to God. Good and evil cannot be equal. Push back evil with what is better, and your enemy will become as close as an old and valued friend. But no one is granted this save those who show patience, and no one is granted this save one of great good fortune. So, looking at the commentators, starting with Tabari, the core of his analysis relates to verse 34, push back evil with what is better which in a more literal rendering might become push against the evil with what is better or more beautiful, ahsan. He paraphrases the verse as follows. God is saying to his prophet Muhammad, may God cover him in grace, O Muhammad, use your mildness, helm, to push back against the ignorance of he who aggresses against you, jahlaman jahila alayk. Apply your forgiveness to those who harm you deliberately. Apply your patience, sabrika, to that which, you delight, that which you dislike in them and which you suffer at their hands. Tabari then offers a somewhat curious story about the first caliph. Abu Bakr was once in the mosque where someone was insulting him while the prophet was watching the situation unfold. He excused him for a while. Then anger overcame Abu Bakr and he produced a riposte. At this, the holy prophet stood and left to be followed perplexedly by Abu Bakr, who asked, the man kept insulting me, and I was forgiving and overlooked the actions while you simply remained seated. But when I started to defend myself, falamma akhattu antasiru, you rose and left. And the prophet, may God bless him and grant him peace, replied, an angel was replying to him on your behalf. But when you started to react and defend yourself, the angel left and the devil came. By God, Abu Bakr, I will never remain in the devil's presence. This story, which ends, I think, with a hint of the next verse, if a prompting from Satan should reach you, seek refuge in God, lies at the core of Tabari's understanding of these verses. For him, they comprise a masterpiece of religious psychology. He goes on like this. The devil may cast into your heart a whispering of the lower self, weswesetun min hadith and nefs, because he desires to make you requite the other's wrong with a wrong of your own. He invites you to do him some wrong yourself, but seek refuge in God from the thoughts the devil inspires. The entire passage is rooted in an awareness of God's scrutiny. Helpfully, Abu Bakr had the blessed prophet to explain what was at stake, but the Qur'an makes this plain. Inna hu huwa as al-alim. He is surely the all-hearing, the all-knowing. Above the jurist, then, there's the theologian, but above the theologian is the one who knows God in an empirical, experiential sense. God as al-qarib, the near. Calling others is the hasana, of which the surah speaks, the beauty and the beautiful act. The highest type of scholar is the one who promotes this goodness through, as Razi puts it, patience in the face of the unbeliever's harm, other, and renouncing revenge, 
ترك الانتقام Razi proceeds to explain how the Ahsan, what is best or most beautiful, can overcome the human willfulness and egotism that cause human beings to reach for false interpretations and even for the outright denial of God and his signs. The Wrangler in the Meccan Market Square or a modern right-wing think tank or on the pages of a modern philosophical journal is not a discarnate, passion-free mind. He is likely to occupy a highly charged, effective habitus in which issues of identity, family or tribe, career and income are all directly at stake. So how is the Meccan preacher or the modern follower concerned to overcome contemporary Islamophobia to defeat the sayya, the passional, egotistic discourse of identity, nation, race, identity, politics and job security of a continent in the tightening grip of populism? Surah Fussilat, in what Razi takes to be its climax, proposes that pushing with what is better, idfa' billatihiya ahsan, better or more beautiful, is the catalyst which is going to break the impasse. This it does not by offering just another still more reasonable argument, since good and evil acts are not equal, but by probing deeper into the effective realms where arguments begin and are chosen. The hasana, the goodly summons to God, the healthy argument is vindicated in the real world of difficult human egos by the ahsan, that which is more beautiful. So Razi says this, God tells us to push against their ignorance and crudeness in what is the most beautiful of ways. For if you endure and are patient with their ugly manners again and again and do not respond to their stupidity with anger and do not react to the hurt that they do, they will feel ashamed of their ugly manners and will abandon their evil habits. Then they will move from hostility to affection, mahabba, and from hatred to love, mawadda. Now this is no standard debating trick or diplomatic stratagem. God regards this as the highest attitude of all as it is useful, quote, for religion, for the harmony of this world, and for our chances in the next. This is why God calls it Haz Azim, a mighty portion or fortune. Razi quotes the Baghdad grammarian as Zajaj, who dies in 923, this beautiful way of behaving is given only to those who patiently endure abuse and suffer hardship and suppress their anger and reject revenge. So the scripturally identified capacity to respond to evil with something more beautiful is a divine gift, haz azim. It is cast upon, yulaqa, those who restrain themselves. Razi describes it as the gift of a virtue of the psyche and an exalted degree, al-fada'il al-nafsaniyya wa darajat al-aliyya. Haz azim means quwa to nafs, spiritual strength, and a pure inward life, safa al-jawhar. And these are the gifts of God such a soul can make choices for the beautiful. <clears throat> Patience and mildness can melt the most stiffly savage heart. Abu Sufyan, arch enemy to the man of praise, a super-rich oligarch puffed up with a thousand angry objections, found faith when he witnessed the Prophet's forgiveness and forbearance when Mecca was finally in his power. Hint bint Otba, who had sworn to kill him, experienced a similar metanoia so that she finally found that as the Sira writer says, no one was more beloved to her than the Prophet. And the Prophet, hearing this, said, your love shall increase. So our conclusion can be quite brief and obvious. While justice is holy, the Quranic showcasing of a radical principle of what is more beautiful is clearly so important in the view of these commentators and expressed so absolutely in the Quranic text that the Muslim response to Islamophobia and the mounting variety of legal disabilities and vexations laid upon Ishmael by an unhappy Europe needs to transcend the vendetta mentality common in ancient Mecca and the modern soapbox and reach for something less sociologically predicted and more authentically rooted in the virtues and wisdom of the classical age of Muslim moral thought. The culminations of the Prophet's ministry are his ascension and his forgiveness of his enemies in Mecca. These climaxes indicate what is deepest and most truly prophetic about Islam. Of course, Muslim forbearance in the face of chauvinism and misrepresentation is already abundantly present. Most take the abuse on the chin silently and keep their hope in God. It's only the radical extreme khulat fringes who take the law into their own hands or who use hate speech to counter the hate speech of liberal or populist polemicists. And this is because of their inner weakness and capitulation. 
to an outraged pride. Generally in Europe and around the world, one finds that traditional Moscow Muslims marvelously retain the virtue of helm, mildness, which a certain Islamophobic discourse claims to be alien to them. Those who travel in Muslim lands or know Muslim communities in the West frequently remark on this. The Mannheim research, I think, indicates the extent of its reach and its success. Commenting on his outreach strategy, the Qur'an tells the man of praise, it was by a mercy of God that you were gentle with them. Had you been harsh and hard of heart, they would have scattered from round about you. Mercy is God's gift, and if politics is the art of persuasion, it is evidently a foremost precondition for the Muslim political life. Here in this remarkable verse, which takes us to the living heart of this prophetic charism, we discover yet another condemnation of tanfir as a vice entirely inauthentic and anti-prophetic. So what is required is not really some kind of liberalizing of Islam, a process which could not easily be distinguished from dilution, but instead a retrieval of the authentic Quranic discourse recalling the first generations who have been given this divine gift of patience, compassion and restraint. Thank you very much, uh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim. Uh, we'll have we've got ten minutes for uh, question and answers. Um, I just want to uh, thank you for your uh, very enlightening uh, uh, lecture. Of course, very academic, and uh, I, I like the way you developed the idea of uh, the tanfir uh, being mm -hmm. changed into ihsan and mm -hmm. how infar billati ahsan is the uh, final solution to overcoming hatred mm -hmm. uh, and, and resentment. Uh, that sadly uh, we fall prey to, uh, and, and this then would be a fantastic bridge for building mm -hmm. the trust. So, who's going to start us off? Sister there. So, Sally, I, uh, I come from the other I sympathize with your um, aptly described skepticism of knee-jerk ideologuing um, and your critique of post-colonial Islamism. But I also feel like this tradition of Islamism also emerges from um, a not very you know, far back 19th century uh, time period where sages were picking up arms <coughs> due to their ihsan, due to their ihsanism. And, uh, speaking out the truth to power and it's, and I feel like the, the the onslaught that Muslims receive not just in the West but globally are not just of words and representation in the media but also of bullets and homes destroyed and babies mangled. So it's it's just a trauma of, of experiencing all this I feel maybe demands us to respond not just to you know cowering in, inwardly to God in hospital and working on our naps but maybe traditionalists can answer to the youth who are traumatized by these images, by this ongoing war, you know, that's still to this day that exists in Yemen, Afghanistan, Iraq, the destruction is real. So I, I feel like as someone who's very sympathetic to both the traditionalists and I also can sympathize as well with the Islamist impetus for justice, why does the onus fall on us uh, to say, oh, these Saudis, these will have these cut ties with them. How can we, as Western Muslims, speak true to power to our own governments, while at the same time not lose our ihsan privately? Yeah, I, thank you. I've been speaking primarily about the situation of Muslims in Britain and Europe, rather than the situation of those who are kind of directly in the firing line in, in the Middle East. <coughs> uh, and I hope that I haven't indicated that there isn't a situation where yeah, the use of force becomes necessary. The Bosnians were faced with ethnic cleansing, mass rape, extermination. Clearly, just pushing back with some kind of rhetorical forgiveness would not have been appropriate in that situation. Ours is not a pacifist tradition. There comes a time when one uses force, and the Sira indicates that. Uh, however disliked it might be to you, uh, sometimes it's required. 
Uh, for us in our situation, <clears throat> if we're dealing with uh, political outrages, then uh, clearly the only way in which we can make our voices heard is to be uh, uh, a decent but firm community that points out uh, in a language that the politicians can understand the uh, self-destructiveness of their policies. Talk to them behind uh, closed doors in the Foreign Office. They know now that the way they abandoned Palestine in 1948 was not in the national interest. They can accept the Muslim sympathy with the Palestinians and uh, embarrassed by what the Balfour Declaration and the Foreign Office did. Uh, that needs to be pushed. Uh, they know now, and we had the Chilcot Inquiry report finally, that their trashing of Iraq was a catastrophe and economically disastrous and also produced Daesh and other forms of, sort of incandescent Islamist opposition which uh, has cost them far more than the oil revenues which they hoped to reap. Their destruction of Libya also, I think, um, they are regretting because it brought <coughs> Daesh and <coughs> mass immigration to the shores of the Mediterranean. So there is a certain contrition. <coughs> they recognize that they destroyed Palestine, they destroyed Iraq, they destroyed Libya, they cut Sudan in two. There's plenty of things for which they are accountable, but the discourse has to be with them, sometimes on human rights terms, but also I think in terms of economics. You have to figure out uh, how to explain to them that these politics didn't deliver the bottom line, which is ultimately what they care about, that it's not good for business. Okay, we've got Mother. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, my question is, with the Muslim community here within Britain, they're quite diverse, which is a strength. Uh, but we do come from, uh, some of us are children of immigrants, second or third generation, some are immigrants, and then we've got, of course, people who are from these shores historically. What challenges are we going to be facing with integration for assimilation uh, in the next 30 to 40 years? And how can we best prevent that? And <coughs> how can we be ambassadors of our faith, representing our faith, when we come to such diverse cultural backgrounds? And what challenges will we be facing in the next 50 years? Thank you for that. Uh, well, <clears throat> I don't possess the gift of, gift of prophecy. I've been speaking in the, the short term. <laughs> Nobody knows um, what the world will look like even in five years. Uh, we don't know if we'll be in the European Union, out of the European Union, what you know, the global situation is a solution. Uh, in National populism in Europe will probably get stronger. We will find more legal disabilities clamped on Muslims. We'll probably find more coercive policies coming towards Muslims from Whitehall, a reinforcement of the Prevent Agenda, I fear. Uh, also more uh, coercive schooling of Muslim kids, uh, similar to the cases that we've recently been, uh, been reading about uh, as these uh, new body beliefs, if you like, become more like certainties. Uh, I think uh, we have to uh, recognize that those who chose to leave the Darul Islam violating all of the rules of Sharia, take their chances and can't grumble too much. They came in order to have bigger helpings of kebabs or whatever. It wasn't for Islam that they came. Uh, and uh, migration is a leap into the unknown. So whatever happens, they shouldn't grumble. Um, but no, we don't, we don't know what will happen. In terms of the ethnicity of the communities. I think you see in a younger generation uh, an increasing impatience with the extreme ethnocentrism of the older generation, of ethnically specific mosques, um, of ethnically specific Islamic organizations. For the young that doesn't really mean too much. There's more intermarriage. Uh, there's a rejection of the specific sectarian Braille v. Deobandi identity that is important to the older generation. And I think as the years go by, you will see that fading. As it faded, for instance, with the Jewish community, which came much earlier with the old divisions between the Sephardic and the Ashkenazi Jews, which were a big deal in the East End of London 100 years ago, now really very muted. So uh, the future is in the hands of the youth, I think, and uh, I'm relatively optimistic. But it's, it's going to be a, a choppy ride. Those who came here just to eat biryani and complain about Islamophobia um, face a lot of difficult <coughs> challenges and traumas, I'm afraid. Thank you very much, uh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad.